Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you all this morning. Well, I'm glad to be here today, guys. Um, pray with me. Father, we recognize that you are here with us, as your word says. And I thank you, Lord, for everybody that's here, for everyone that we've drawn, for even those who will be watching on the internet. And Lord, I pray that you would take your word and apply it to our heart in the places where we need it. And oh, Lord, we need it. So I pray, Lord Jesus, that you might cover us with your grace, that you might inspire us by your spirit, that you might give us wisdom and help us to see you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning we're going through a very exciting passage. We're back in the book of Luke. So sorry. We're back in the book of Luke. We're going to take the remaining verses, which talks about hypocrisy. Everybody goes, ooh. Oh, that wasn't, that wasn't hardly even awake. Everyone goes, ooh. Ooh, there you go. Little class participation. Jesus is going to confront the Pharisees about their hypocrisy. And he's going to go through all of these woes. And so as we go through, it's a good idea for us to kind of check our life to see if any of that stuff has crept into our hearts. Because if it could creep into the hearts of the Jewish people, it could certainly creep into our hearts. Amen? And so as we take a look at it, highlight verse for today is chapter 11, verse 34. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. When your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. How many of you are lost? Oh, you, get, you guys all know this? Oh, just two. There's, I'll just talk to you guys then. Just to remind you where you are. This is where we were in the beginning of chapter 11, where Jesus teaches us how to pray. We call it the Lord's Prayer, but it was really the disciples' prayer. And the Lord shows us how to pray, how to call upon the Lord. And he says, pray in this manner or in this way. And we looked at the blueprint of what that is and what prayer is. And following that, last week, we went into um, Jesus casting out demon. And then there was this big teaching on demons and how they go through arid places and they, they seek for a place to be and they don't find rest. And so they come back to the house that they left and they bring seven spirits worse than the first because it was uninhabited and it was unfilled. And so we talked about that last week. This week, we're going to talk about confronting hypocrisy. I'm just going to read through it first, starting at verse 33. No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket but on a lampstand, that those who come may see the light. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light, and when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. And as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. And so he went in and he sat down to eat. And the Pharisee saw it. He marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And then the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and the dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones. Did you... Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But rather, give alms of such things as you have, that indeed all things are clean to you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and, they, and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Woe to you, Pharisees. For you love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you all are like graves, which are not seen, which men who walk over them are not aware of them. Then one of the lawyers answered and said to him, Teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us also. And he said, Woe to you also, lawyers. 
For you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve of the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore, the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which have shed from the blood which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and those who were entering in you hindered. And as you said these things to, as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something that he might say that they might accuse him. Sounds like a, a very nice time, like maybe your Thanksgiving table was like this. <laughs> but Jesus confronts the Pharisaic mentality. And so we're going to begin with the first verse in verse 33. No one, when he has put a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket on a lamp, but on a lampstand for those who come may see the light. It's interesting because Jesus was just talking about Jonah being a light to Nineveh. He was talking about this example of the Queen of Sheba who came to see Solomon, who was the light of his time. He was in wisdom. And he says, nobody takes a light and puts it under a bushel. And of course, you and I know what that means because Jesus explains it in Matthew. But I think it could also mean something slightly different. When Jesus said, let your light so shine among men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father who's in heaven. We know that one from Matthew this one, he's talking about light. And I think he's talking about God's light. That God has made himself evident in so many ways, like a light. And he himself is proclaiming himself to be the light. As you know, he says that later on in the word. So he's saying nobody, including God himself, doesn't take a light and puts it under a bushel. In other words, here I am and you guys get to see what God is really like. And yet they rejected his ministry, didn't they? We know that we're called by Jesus to be the light of the world, but as long as Jesus was here, he says, I am the light of the world. So it got me to thinking a little differently about it. So I think about Jonah, I think about Solomon and the Queen of Sheba and how light came to them and how they rejected it, at least Jonah did, and the people of Nineveh accepted it. So how God's light showed up. In Psalm 119, 105, it says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And it's funny, it's not usually uh, uh, something that shows you something far away. It shows you something right here in front of you as the word of God does. It always reveals the secrets of our hearts. In Proverbs 6, 23 says, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. In other words, we're never done learning, are we? And things, us being confronted with things, like the Pharisees are being confronted at this point, that will never end. I don't know about you, but do you ever get like uh, traumatized? Yes. <laughs> when somebody tells you something or when you realize that you've made a big mistake? Yes. You get that sort of rush of adrenaline, you might change colors and... You know, you feel your heart beating and you don't know what to think or what to do. And you ever had that? A couple of you. Okay, good. I'm not alone. The word of God will always do that. Reproofs are a way of life. It's one of those things where we just have to get used to it, don't we? Hardship and difficulty is going to come to all of us. We have a choice how we're going to digest it or reject it. And I think especially when you know that the Holy Spirit's behind it and we have a loving father who forgives us of our sins, it's easy to confess those things. You remember when you were a kid and your parents put you to sleep and they 
barge back into your room because they heard some noise and they say, are you sleeping? And you say, yes. <laughs> and there's the light under the blanket, you know, because you're playing with some toy or you're reading some book or something. Light is that way. It just can't be hidden and you, you shouldn't put it under a blanket or, or any of that. It needs to be exposed. And it's the same with us. Uh, Matthew 5, 14, Jesus says, you are the light of the world and a city that is on a hill cannot be hidden. So you're probably familiar with that one. Ephesians 5, 8, for you were once in darkness, but now you are the light of, in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And in 1 Peter 2, 9, for you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I, I think it's not coincidental that Genesis opens up with that. You know, in the beginning, God, and there was light, the first thing that was created. Jesus likens himself unto light, and he tells us that we are the light of the world. So Jesus is teaching us not to hide and that we shouldn't hide the light that God's given to us, right? So how many people do you share Christ with this week? Reproofs of instruction are a way of life. Hey, get used to it. Verse 34, the lamp of the body is the eye. How many of you don't get that? You all get that. Okay, we'll move on. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. It's an interesting concept. This might help. In John chapter 12, 35 to 37, Jesus said this. Jesus said to them, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. For he who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. It is possible to see Jesus face to face and see him do all of these miracles and yet not believe. The eye is the lamp of the body, is that which brings light. It is that which you perceive, that which you see. And if you have trouble with your eyes, like I do, I need spectacles. That's why these big letters are good for me. You'll notice that if your eyes are good and you, you can see what you're doing, everything is well, especially if you're driving at night. I heard some groans, good. But when something happens to your eye, yeah, I know some of you have mental illnesses about this. When something happens to your eyes, either it's glaucoma or something of that nature, the light is no longer coming in. The light doesn't cease to exist though, does it? The light's there, but you can't perceive it. It was that way with these guys. Jesus was right in front of them, but they couldn't see him. And that's what happens when your eyes are bad. And he even calls the Pharisees like the blind leading the blind. They're both going to fall into the pit. And so Jesus talks about this. I like the fact that he proclaims, I am the light of the world. And then he heals a blind guy. Those are not coincidental. The teaching goes with the healing. So here's somebody who did something crazy. It was a model who got um, a tattoo on her eye. This is a thing now. People are doing things like this. See, this is, this is to keep you paying attention. And of course, you guys know about glaucoma and how that happens and how it erodes the eye. When your eye is bad, when your eye goes bad, when your sight is bad, that's it. The, the light and the perception that you have on the outside. And Jesus tells us, be careful that the light in you is not darkness, that you don't think you have an understanding of who Jesus is or who God is, and yet you don't. Be careful that you don't think you're walking in the light when you're not. Light has to be perceived. Jesus Christ and his offering and his life need to be received. The Holy Spirit needs to be received. And all of that is going to come through the, the eyes of our heart, if you will. 
If then your whole body is full of light, having no dark part, the whole body will be full of light as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. So Jesus is encouraging us, make sure that you don't have any dark spots in your heart. Make sure that you've got clear vision. You know, there are certain things that happen in our lives that give us bad vision in, in our spiritual life. Like your upbringing, how'd that go? Did you have perfect parents? Probably twisted you up in some way. Probably accounts for some damage. And you have to be careful, especially if you have children of your own, that you don't pass down those really bad behaviors and thought patterns to your kids. And so there, you want to make sure that there isn't some kind of a dark spot in your own life that you're not passing on. In John 1, verses 5 to 9, this is the message which you have heard from him and declare to you that God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us of all sin. Did you catch that? It's not about a once and done thing that you did and you, you walked an altar and said a prayer and got a Bible or something. As we walk in the light, if we are continually walking in the light, you see, it's a way of life for us. And you never get to a place where you say, okay, now I know everything. I don't need any more teaching. It never happens. I think about Samson. Samson was a guy who was not fully given over. He had a special birth. It was miraculous. It was prophesied. His, he grew up with really great parents who sought the Lord and who made sacrifices. They were told, bring him up in a certain way. And they did. They fed him special food. They kept him away from alcohol. And, you know, they did all these great, great things. But he wasn't fully given over to the purposes of God. And so he chased skirts, to put it bluntly. And so he finds a girl who's from a bad family, who's got a bad reputation. He goes, that's the one I want because she looks good to me. His parents are like, couldn't you find, couldn't you pick somebody better? I don't know if you have kids and you'd feel that way, but I don't. Couldn't you find somebody better? I mean, come on. So Samson was a guy who had a foot in each camp, so to speak. He was called by God to do certain things and yet his heart was going in another direction. So he had at least, he, his eyesight, if you will, was not single. It was divergent. And so he messes up big time. We find him as a slave in a dungeon and cranking out work and blind. It's interesting, the very thing that caused him to fall is what he lost, his eyes. Then you think about Lot. Lot, who entrenched himself into a very rich area because he thought, hey, this is easy street, you know, the American way. And it, it worked out really terrible for him. We see Lot towards the end of his life in a cave committing incest. So we have to be careful that our hearts, we have all these great examples of what not to be, as well as good examples of what to be in the scriptures. I think about King Saul, who in the beginning was very humble. In fact, he hid among the luggage as they were trying to find him. He was a head taller than everybody else, and they couldn't find him. They found him hiding. So he was very timid in his heart in the very beginning. But then as things went along, he got prideful, and he tried to kill David, and he got jealous, and you know, he just did terrible things. And we see Saul at the end of his life, King Saul's going and consulting with a witch because he's losing the kingdom. So when the scripture says that we should be careful that we don't have any dark part in our heart, it's something that we should take note of because there are some notable examples of what we shouldn't do. Amen? Amen. Verse 37, and as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> and so he went in and he sat down to eat. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not washed before dinner. Ooh, I'm telling. I mean, washing's important, but to the Jews, it was hugely important. 
you go in and they, they have a special bowl with water there. And there's a way, there's a way that you have to wash your hands and you never let it go up your elbow or you're unclean. It's, there's like a very ceremonial ritualistic way in which they would wash. And it was a big deal. It was called a baptism, strangely enough, because there's an immersing of your hands and there's a certain way. And somebody would come up with a towel, almost like you're scrubbing in and to, to dry off your hands. And so it was a big deal. And it's a bigger deal when you consider the way they ate like this. No forks, no spoons, no serving spoons, just your hand. And so your hand dips into the dish with everybody else and you put it in your mouth. And then that thing that you just had in your mouth goes back in the dish with everyone else. You guys are concerned about people double dipping chips and stuff. This is another <laughs> world. But the Pharisee was more amazed, not for the hygienic end of it, but for the ritualistic end of it, that Jesus wasn't performing all of the rituals that a Pharisee might do or a rabbi might observe. And so this guy's judging Jesus because he didn't wash. If you remember, Jesus spoke about this earlier, Matthew chapter 15, verses 17 to 20. Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. For out of the heart, proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemes. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. If you remember, his disciples were criticized for not washing and Jesus responded and defended them and say, you guys are way too circumspect about such a very small thing. But that was kind of their MO. They were very, very particular about a lot of small things. Verse 39, Jesus is sitting down with the Pharisee and he's eating. Then the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. I wonder if you invited Jesus over for a meal, if he would talk to you like that. But I imagine they needed it. Foolish ones. Did not he who made the outside also make the inside also? Jesus is saying, you guys have a very serious problem with looking at the appearance of things and not the reality of things. You have a preoccupation with the way things look. Any of you have an understanding of what that is? How, how many times you look at a mirror today? <laughs> I apparently didn't do enough because my wife felt she needed to groom me before I came up here. I'm not even going to tell you what she wanted to do to me before I came up here. <laughs> she wanted to fix me all up, but a preoccupation with the outside without thinking about the inside is what they got into about rituals and about external appearances. If we're not careful, we can get caught up in it. I mean, everything that you see on TV, you know, is very, very focused and targeted and there's millions of dollars put into that advertising. Sometimes there's more money put into the effort of packaging a thing and making it look attractive than the thing itself. And that's all because people make appearance a big deal. You know, you got to keep up with the Joneses. They got a new car. I, I can't park my car in my driveway next to them. I mean, look, I got to get a new car. It's a terrible thing. And you can get really stuck in that. And Jesus is saying, you, you do a real good job of looking nice on the outside, but on the inside is different. He says here in Matthew 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Jesus is not giving them a health and wealth message at this point. He's not making them feel good. He's telling them their faults and he's flat out putting it out there for everybody to see. You know, there's a time for that. And he's saying, you're all concerned with the outside, not the inside. Yet inwardly, you're full of death. You've got things going on in your head and in your heart that are detestable before God, but everybody thinks on the outside, boy, you, you look good. You must have it together. You, you must be a holy person with all that special clothing and everything. 
And yet they wouldn't let on that they struggled with the same things that you and I would struggle with. It's a little like going to get your car washed. You guys wash your car, right? I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, just for the fact that I might be in it someday. <laughs> but it's like washing your car, but you know that cup that holds your coffee? That, that part in the dashboard, you know, and might have change stuck to it because of the coffee that spilled on your change and, you know, gum wrappers and maybe there's gum wrapped in a wrapper that busted loose and squished out and, you know, it's like that. And Jesus is saying, you're like that cup in my car. <laughs> and you should, you should be more concerned with the inside because, you know, that stuff will get you sick, but the dirt on the outside of your car won't get you sick. And he says, but rather give alms to such things as you have, then indeed all things are clean to you. Does that confuse anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Then I have a job. <laughs> I, I do the sacrilegious thing and you'll have to forgive me. Sometimes I rewrite the Bible. Give to the needy ones around you from a heart of compassion and you won't see dirty people. Give to the needy ones around you, that's give alms, of such things as you have from a heart of compassion, if you have one, and you won't see dirty people, and then everything will be okay. Because if you're not loving other people, like God said, and if you're not willing to give and to sacrifice for other people, what you'll tend to do is sit back and judge them. Unless you're willing to engage with them. And that's a very different thing, isn't it? That's a completely different mentality. I mean, if you go up to somebody that's homeless and you look at the outside, you say, eight feet, stay eight feet away. I can smell you from here anyway. And you judge completely based upon appearances. You say, well, it must be your fault. You must have done something. How come you don't have any family? You probably burned every bridge you have. You know, and all these things tend to go through people's minds, almost like an excuse that you don't reach out and help. And that's the kind of thing that goes through our heads, sadly to say. I like this sign, I have no excuse, just need. Some help would be greatly appreciated. God bless. That's a good sign right there. I don't have any excuses. This was a girl who was actually on a campus. I actually read all the stories behind these things, but I don't tell you because I don't have time. This was a gentleman who was found by someone and did a complete makeover on him. And you can see the before and after difference. Looking beneath the surface and seeing the human being beneath all of that mess and neglect is something that Jesus did exceptionally well. He could also see through people that put up this paper thin exterior looking like they were, had it all together and they didn't. So reaching out to other people and having compassion on them, suddenly you're not going to see them as problems or issues or stumbling blocks or a drain on your economy or anything. You're going to see them as a need and you're going to reach out to them. And so Jesus said, instead of sitting back and judging me for not washing my hands, why don't, why don't you think about other people and how you might be a blessing to them? And from a heart of compassion, what hopefully you have you can actually give away those things that you have in your heart. But if you don't have it, then you can't give it away. It's joy over judgment because it's always a joy to serve other people, right? Christmas is coming. You guys know that, right? Did you notice the decorations up? Oh, we have... Look later. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, if you remember, Samuel goes to find the next king and he's told to go to a certain household who has a bunch of boys. He's not told who it is. And he sees the first guy, his name's Eliam. And he goes, ha, oh, there's a good looking guy. That's a kingly looking dude. And the Lord says this, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For a man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so he went through all of the sons from the oldest all the way to the youngest. And he goes, what, are you out of sons? He said, yeah, we kind of are. Oh, wait a minute. The runt. We sent the runt. He's out watching the sheep because, you know, 
He doesn't need to be here. He's not important. And so they said, call him in. Here comes this ruddy red-haired kid from the field. And the Lord says, that's the next king of Israel. Because the Lord does not see as we do. He looks at the heart. You know the difference between looking at the outside and looking at a heart, looking at a human being, looking at a person? Suddenly, all of the things on the outside don't matter. Service of others will subjugate self. The best way to get over depression, which is very self-focused, is to help somebody else. Verse 42, but woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. <laughs> they were punctilious. Yes, it's our vocabulary word for the day. <laughs> punctilious, where we get the word punctual. Meticulous, precise and fastidious. You like that? I like looking up words and confusing people. These guys were majoring in the minors. I, I love this cartoon. It says, so in college, what, did you, what was your major in? Business poetry. Yeah, you know, like something a basketball player might do if he's very good at basketball, is major in basket weaving or, or something of that nature. The Pharisees were huge on majoring in the minors, but they minored in the majors which is the problem. And we can get that way too, right? We can hold our convictions sometimes above the word of God. We can hold our opinions. Oh, sorry, I hurt somebody there. You can hold your opinions up above the word of God to where your opinion is more important than what the word of God says. And when confronted with the truth, you're willing, not willing to yield. So, we have to be careful that we don't major in business poetry because that won't do anything on your menu. I love this. Caution, this sign has sharp edges. Do not touch the edges of this sign. Also, the bridge is out ahead. The focus is on the wrong thing. It, it should say the bridge is out. And probably don't even need to say anything about the sign because it's self-evident. Like, oh, let me run my hand on that thing. Yes. But that's what it is to major in the minors, to minor in the majors. And what they forgot was the justice and the love of God and from Malachi 6.8. What does the Lord require of you but to act justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly with your God? So if you had to boil it down to three things from the Old Testament, this is pretty good. It, Jesus boils it down to two things in the New Testament. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But Malachi breaks it down, act justly, do what's right. Love mercy, which isn't loving mercy for yourself. It's loving mercy on other people. And it's walking humbly with our God. That's a good passage, Micah 6, 8. And in Matthew 23, verses 23 to 24, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin, but neglected the weightier matters of the law, like justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. These Pharisees were so fastidious that they would, if they got a gnat in their mouth, they would, <coughs> they would choke, they would vomit, they would make a big show of it because they got a gnat. And that gnat may have landed on some unclean thing and therefore they may be declared unclean because they ate a gnat. None of them had motorcycles. <laughs> but they were focused on the teeny weeny little thing and yet... They'll swallow a camel. Actually, these guys used to go outside the city gates of Jerusalem and they'd stop at like the local hot dog cart and, and they'd order some, you know, mystery meat and they'd sit there and eat and they wouldn't even ask what kind it was. They would just chow it. Oh, this is good. They're eating camel, which is 
unkosher. And so you guys will go out on these little benders and it's okay as long as you don't know what you're eating. But you'll freak out about a little gnat in your mouth. That's what Jesus said about how fastidious they were. It's like the guy who works out all the time and his chest is massive and his arms are huge and his legs are like sticks. You've made too much of this and not enough. They're called chicken men. You've never seen these? Anyway, never mind. Don't be punctilious. Verse 43, woe to you Pharisees for you love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace. You know, public praise where people see you and their eye is upon you and you're always respected because my goodness, you have all of those clothes on which really make you stand out. And then of course you have phylacteries on. Phylacteries are these little prayer boxes with the word of God in them and they used to put them on their forehead because the Old Testament says that you should always keep the word of God as frontlets before your eyes. It doesn't mean you're supposed to wear it like an ornament. It means that you're supposed to always be viewing everything through the word of God, that the word of God filters everything that you see and whatever you pay attention on. And it says that you should always keep it close to your heart. And so what they would do is they would tie one of those boxes on their left arm because there's an artery that runs right to your heart. And they figured, well, that's as close as I can get to my heart. So let's wrap it around my arm. And you may, if you go to Israel, you'll still see these things. And yet keeping in my heart means that it directs my affections. It directs my intention. It directs my will. Not that I wear it as an ornament. And you can see how you can get into all of these external rituals and completely neg neglect the real meaning of what the scripture says. We can get into some form of godliness, but deny the power of it. So we want to be careful. So they got all wrapped up in how they looked and where they sat and, you know, who was greeting them in the marketplace. Oh, rabbi, rabbi. Be careful you don't get hung up on a title. You know, we have a doctor that goes to church here. It's not me. You knew that. But he doesn't insist on being called doctor. Isn't that good? I think that's good. In Matthew 23, he says this, Jesus says, put all their works, but all their works they do to be seen by men. That was the whole problem with the Pharisees. It was an exhibition. They make their phylacteries broad and they enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at the feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called by men, rabbi, rabbi. But you do not be called rabbi. For one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father. For one is your father who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers. For one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Amen. Jesus says, beware of taking on titles that exalt you above other people. Because if you do that, you're not being like Jesus. In fact, a lot of times he pushed people aside and didn't even tell them who he was. He just showed him who he was. Amen. Reputation over character. They were more concerned with reputation than they were about character. Character is actually who you are and what you do when no one's looking. It wasn't about what people say about you, what people think about you, you know, who's talking bad about you or who's talking good about you. It's about who you are before God. That's more important, isn't it? And they got their eyes off of it. Woe to you. Yeah, he's not done. <laughs> Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. A hypocrite is one who plays a part. It's an actor, by the way. Somebody who wears a mask and sometimes uh, because they didn't have any female actors actually throughout the, the Greco-Roman period, they would have men pretending to be women. Some things never change. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like graves which are not seen and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. This is actually a picture of a um, burial ground. It, it used to be a cemetery and over the years, various people owned it 
and they took all of the gravestones off and sold them for stone. And then the bodies are still left there. It's in Tampa, Florida, and they're having a big argument about it. And here are some guys walking on corpses. Isn't that exciting? But that happens all the time, especially not here in the United States, but in Europe. They just found this mass grave actually in France. And so they have this kind of thing where people are walking on dead bodies. Jesus's point is this. People walk over you and you guys are full of dead bodies and you contaminate those who go near you. Anyone who comes near you is contaminated and they don't even know it. They've just been affected by you in a negative fashion. And they thought they were God's gift to the world teaching the scriptures. And he said, you don't understand. You infect people when they go by you. By the way, these are some mass graves in Iran for the coronavirus. And these are some people in New York. Interesting detail. One in 10 local COVID victims are destined for Hart Island, New York City Potter's Field. They actually went to one of those islands. If you're going over the Verrazano, you can see some of those islands that are out there in the water in New York. They're considered New York. They're kind of on the border. Um, they actually went to one of these islands and they dug a mass grave and started putting people in there that had COVID. So one in 10 local people from New York City are actually buried in a mass grave. So the things I see, verse 45, and then one of the lawyers answered and said to him, teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us also. You hurt my feelings. And he said, woe to you also, lawyers. But by the way, these, these lawyers aren't lawyers like y you might understand, like, you know, a thousand lawyers at the bottom of the ocean joke. You, you, you know that joke? Oh. Yeah, you know what a thousand lawyers on the bottom of the ocean is. It's a good start. It's a bad joke, but there it is. It's not that kind of lawyer. These guys were, these were like scribes. What they would do is they would look through the scriptures and they would denote them and write them down and be copyists. But they were also professionals on what it said because they were copying them all the time. They would be the people that would help you with application and what to do. So they were like the theologians of their time. Woe to you also, lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. You see, they were good about telling everyone what they should do and how the law applies to them, but they themselves were unwilling to do it themselves. That's the very definition of hypocrisy, right? Telling people what to do. And they would load these burdens. They would inform people and teach people all these things about, oh, you got to go and you got to do and you, go, oh, that's not good enough. And God's not happy with you. And well, what else do I have to do? And you can see all these innocent people that really just want to serve God get loaded down with all these rituals. And suddenly they're performing all these crazy rituals. And, and maybe you come out of a background where that's what you had. <coughs> Some ritualistic form of serving God and thinking, I'm going to make God happy if I do this thing. And yet you walk out and you live like hell for a week. I don't know. Maybe just some people I know. It's like this. <clears throat> you know anybody that looks like that? Loaded down with have to's, got to's, got to get to. Galatians 6 2 says that we should bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You see, it's not about loading burdens on people, it's about serving and taking burdens off of people. They had it in reverse. So, verse 47 For woe to you, you build the tombs of the prophets and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve of the deeds of your father, for indeed they killed them, and you build their tombs. You see, if you look through the history of the Jewish people, Stephen gives a really good sermon in the book of Acts about how people throughout the scripture times have always resisted the Holy Spirit, and how they always just resisted hearing God's word and the truth proclaimed to them. So it's not anything new that's, that's today. And he says, you build their tombs. And you, if you know anything about uh, somebody who's Jewish, they, they very much associate with themselves 
Abraham. Abraham's our father. He's our, uh, you know, progenitor. He's the, the head of our tribe, if you will. And they're really affiliated with him because the promises came to Abraham, didn't they? That through his seed, all of the nations would be blessed, meaning Christ. So they build the temples of the prophets that their forefathers killed. I, I think that's an amazing thing. It almost seems like penance, right? Well, you know, I don't want them to think I was part of it, so I'll build a fancy tomb and, and put their body in it. But, you know, when it comes to claiming the promises, oh, yeah, Abraham's my father, but they wouldn't associate themselves with the people that picked up stones and stoned the prophets. And we tend to make a big deal out of where our remnant is going to end up, right? I don't know if any of you have like a mausoleum set up or like a private room where you're you will occupy for the rest of time before the Lord comes back if you get there. People t spend a lot of money and a lot of time, especially if you get caught without preparation. It, it costs a lot of money to die. That's why I'm going to get raptured. It's much, much less expensive. Therefore, the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles and some of them they will kill and persecute that the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. Well, my question is why, why are the people of that generation? Why are they going to pay for all of the sins of the people in the past? The scripture says that everyone is going to have to stand and give an account for their own behavior, not the behavior of those before. And here Jesus says, you guys are going to be guilty of all the blood that's been shed all the way back to Abel. How can they be guilty of that blood? Because Jesus is there and they're rejecting him. And so they associate with those who have gone before. And they are going to be the ones held accountable because they've had more light. And with more light, there is more responsibility. The more that you know, the more that you're expected to know. And God is going to hold us accountable. In John 9, verses 5 and 6, says, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and he made clay with his saliva and he anointed the eyes of a blind man with clay. Isn't that funny? I think that's a funny verse. He says, I'm the, I'm the light of the world. <clears throat> and he made some spit mud and wiped it in some guy's eyes. I'm the, how would you like me to teach like that? Work, work one up and mix it with the carpet. And I mean, can you imagine? But Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. And he spits which would be very distracting for me and makes mud with his hands, which he didn't wash when he went to the Pharisee's house. And, <laughs> and he wipes them in the eyes of a blind guy and he heals him. Do you think there's a connection? You know, Jesus still does that today, doesn't he? He opens blind eyes. He brings light to our hearts. He gives us understanding. Verse 52. Woe to you lawyers. Yeah, he's not done. For you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, nor yourselves, and those who were entering, you hindered. He says, not only are you off base and you're not going to make it to heaven, but the people you teach aren't going to make it. And they were trying to get there. And you betrayed them by taking the key of knowledge. You know what the key of knowledge is? Did you ever lose your keys? Well, these guys intentionally threw it away and buried it. What is the key of knowledge? Well, let me give you one scripture. It might help you. Oh, sorry. This is what they did. You, you can't go in here. And Jesus says they were trying to get in, but they couldn't get in. By the way, the key to knowledge is Jesus. It says here in Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge 
of the Holy One is understanding. The key to understanding any of the scriptures is Jesus. You go all the way back to Genesis. I will put enmity between your seed and the woman's seed. What's that? It's about Jesus. And he will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. What's that about? It's about Jesus. And you can go page after page after page. After. Abraham, God says, take your son, your only son, which, wait, he had a one before. No, his only son, and take him up onto a mountain that I'll show you, Mount Moriah, which happens to be Golgotha. And I want you to sacrifice him to me. God wants a human sacrifice? That's completely other than the way God's ever been. Jesus, oh, because that's what God did. He sent his only son to die for us. And he actually let it happen as opposed to stopping it like with Abraham and brings a ram who's caught in a thicket. Interesting, his, his horns are caught in a thicket. Jesus, when he went to the cross, had a crown of thorns on his brow. Wow. Jesus is the key of wisdom all the way through the scriptures. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to fly. And as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently. They were, they were angry. And to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something that, they might, uh, that he might say that they might accuse him. How many of you argue? Okay. How many of you really argue? You really argue... Okay, good, good. I was just waiting for a little participation. It's so easy to get sucked up into an argument, especially when you're right. Which you might feel as always, and yet it's not. But to argue, you know, and there are schools to learn how to debate and to argue and to win arguments, and there are skills and learning to understand and all that. I don't know why they teach you that in college, because it doesn't give you information. It just gives you a way of wiggling out of the truth. But what they did is they just were looking for something. They didn't listen. They were just looking to retort. You know, when somebody says, hey, you got bad breath. And say, yeah, well, you're short and balding, you know. <laughs> It's like that kind of, it's like that kind of thing. And you're not even speaking about something that's important. You're just trying to hurt in response. And that's what they did in response to Jesus's teaching. They just responded in anger. I would hope that you guys never do that. When the Lord speaks to your heart or you hear the Lord speaking to you or someone else comes to you and tells you the truth, I, I would hope that you could be sensitive enough to hear the spirit of God in the background speaking to you. Hypocrisy dies hard, and it dies hard in us. And we're supposed to be on guard and make sure that there's no dark spot inside of us where that could happen. Because Jesus deserves our 100% surrender, doesn't he? I mean, every aspect of our lives, he deserves it all. Because he came from heaven, put on a human body, died and shed his blood, and was accused of all sorts of things he never did so that you and I would have our payment paid in advance so that we could inherit heaven and we could have eternal life and a relationship with God. And without that, we're just wandering around like a bunch of blind people. God gives light. Be careful that you don't resist the light. Enjoy the light while it comes and drink it in and respond to it in a way that glorifies God, because there might be a time when you don't have that.